I'm sorry about that before. Okay. Good evening, everyone. Sorry about the delays. There's a storm here and it's destroying the broadband. My name is Barry O'Neill, and I'd like to begin by thanking the learned professors and the organisers for giving me the opportunity to speak to you tonight. I am a consultant surgeon in Sligo in the Republic of Ireland, right up in the northwest coast. And my primary surgical interests are trauma and elective foot and ankle surgery. Now, as we are based in a mountainous region right on the edge of the Atlantic Ocean on the northwest coast, we've got a very diverse clientele of hill walkers, surfers, horse riders, and extreme sports enthusiasts. There are also farms and heavy industry nearby, which bring their own unique cocktail of potential contaminants whenever there's a, an open injury. So these factors combine to provide a very direct, a diverse range of injuries to the foot and ankle. And I plan to discuss this with you tonight and also just to give you my thoughts on basic principles and uh, maybe discuss a case or two. I would say that a lot of what I'm about to say has already been discussed this evening already. The talks have all been excellent, um, but a lot of the stuff you're going to hear now is repetition, I'm afraid. But I'll begin by discussing some general uh, principles regarding open fractures, and I'll then talk about the initial management of these injuries in the emergency department. And I'd also like to discuss early management in theatre and definitive management also. And finally, we'll look at some of the complications that can be associated with fractures in the foot or the ankle. So it's really important to remember the basic definition of a fracture. This has been discussed already tonight. A fracture is a soft tissue injury, which just happens to be complicated by the presence of a broken bone. And as we all know, if you do not respect the soft tissues, then no matter how good your surgical management of the injury is, it's doomed to fail. So an open fracture is a fracture where there's a soft tissue deficit that communicates with the broken bone. And this deficit breaches the body's primary defense against contamination and significantly raises the risk of deep infection in the soft tissues and in the bone itself. Now, a study by Court Brown et al. in Edinburgh in 2012 has shown that 2.3% of fractures are open fractures. It also shows that 80% of open fractures occur as a result of low energy injuries, and that 17% of open fractures occur within the foot of the ankle. So as with any fracture, the goals of treating open fractures fall into three categories. One, preserve life. Much like the principle of not focusing on the bony injury to the detriment of the soft tissue injury, you must not allow yourself to be distracted by the open ankle injury and forget about the patient's other needs. Always use ATLS principles and ensure that the patient remains alive before turning your attention to the nasty open ankle fracture. Do not allow this injury on the left to distract your attention away from this injury on the right. Principle number two, preserve limb. During the American Civil War, 26% of those who suffered an open fracture of any sort subsequently died. Now, thanks to the advancements in our knowledge, our clinical skills, and the tools now available to us, this is no longer the case. And principle three, preserve function. Again, as the management of open fractures has evolved, we now have the skills and the technology to ensure that the functional outcome after these injuries is such that most people can and do get back to work, get back to sports, and get back to their lives in general. Prolonged immobilization in heavy casts is no longer required for most of these injuries. And early mobilization with appropriate physiotherapy and occupational therapy should be encouraged to minimize the time spent incapacitated by the patient. And once the patient has been stabilized using ATLS principles, we can inspect the primary area of interest, the foot or the ankle. Certainly it's my primary area of interest. We will of course the, inspect the rest of the limb for obvious wounds such as this, but we must also look for occult wounds, which may be a long way away from the fracture site, but still represent a skin breach and therefore an increased risk of infection. Surgical emphysema or air within the soft tissues as seen on this radiograph may be the only clue that an occult wound is present. Careful inspection of all parts of the affected limb is essential. And beware the impending fracture. Gross anatomical deformity, skin tenting and skin tethering or mottling may be an indication of imminent skin rupture. 
these injuries should be reduced immediately. What we don't want this injury that we have here turning into this, while the patient is lying on a trolley in the radiology department waiting for an x-ray. These are x-ray images that were taken in my emergency department here in Sligo. They are, in my opinion, x-rays that should never have been taken. Now, I'm told that this injury was present when a, the patient arrived in the emergency department and it wasn't allowed to develop after the patient arrived. But again, the x-ray should never have been taken. Prompt reduction and immobilization is essential with these injuries, especially when it's grossly deformed and this always precedes radiological investigation. The initial treatment of open fractures in the foot of the ankle is exactly the same as the treatment that's already been discussed in fractures elsewhere. Any gross contaminants must be removed. A culture swab should be taken before and after thorough wound lavage with sterile saline, and a neurovascular examination of the foot should be completed before photographs are taken of the wound when it's then covered and splinted. Radiographs can be arranged after this. The dressings and splintage should not be further disturbed until the patient is in a sterile operating theater. Halverson et al. have shown that 9% of all open fractures will have a concomitant arterial injury and clinical assessment of the vascular status of the foot is essential and should be augmented with Doppler ultrasound or CT arteriogram if there is any doubt about the status. If a vascular injury is confirmed, early consultation with a vascular surgeon is essential. Historically, an insensate foot was assumed to indicate a poor prognosis, but more recent studies by Boss et al. found no difference in the long-term outcomes between feet that were initially insensate and those that were sensate. They also showed that some patients who were initially perceived to have an insensate foot subsequently had significantly improved sensation. They concluded that lack of plantar foot sensation should not be assumed to be caused by nerve transection. Always be vigilant to the possibility of compartment syndrome in both in the leg and in the foot. Compartment syndrome in the leg can complicate ankle fractures or low tibial fractures. Compartment syndrome of the foot is more commonly associated with calcaneal fractures and Liz Frank injuries. Tendon injuries can also occur, but remain largely underreported in the literature. The early management of the open fracture begins with a thorough debridement of the wound in the theatre. It is essential that all gross contaminants are removed and all necrotic tissue, including bone, should also be removed. Tissue which is deemed questionable should also be removed. The old adage, if in doubt, cut it out, definitely applies. And the wound, sh the wound should be extended in both directions to facilitate this procedure. For many years, we believed that the timing of the first debridement was important, and that debridement of the wound within six hours led to a lower incidence of infection and better outcomes overall. This six hour period, as has already been discussed this evening, was known as a golden period, but it was based on what now seems to be relatively poor evidence. The more recent evidence suggests that whilst prompt surgical debridement is advisable, the early administration of appropriate antibiotics is much more important than the time to surgery. Also more important is the quality of the debridement. So which antibiotics should we use? When should we start them? And how long do we need to continue their use? Traditionally, we've used first generation cephalosporins to treat open fractures. This is due to research that shows that surgical site infections are predominantly caused by gram positive organisms. However, much of that research was carried out prior to the emergence of MRSA. Pizakis and Wilkins have demonstrated that the infection rate when antibiotics are given within three hours of the injury is 4.7%, but this rises to 7.4% if the antibiotics are given um, after three hours post-injury. And Dellinger et al. have shown no benefit in continuing antibiotic therapy beyond the 24 hours of surgery, while the Surgical Infection Society guideline shows no benefit in continuing antibiotics beyond 48 hours. In Gustillo and Anderson's classic 1976 paper on open tibial fractures, they stated that internal fixation should not be used in open fractures because of the risk of implant-related infection. Subsequent studies, however, have shown that it is safe to use internal fixation immediately, so long as the debridement has been thorough and adequate and appropriate antibiotics are given early. 
In 1984, Franklin et al. reported in 38 open ankle fractures that were treated with immediate debridement and internal fixation. They reported no infections and hypothesized that the bony stabilization actually protected the soft tissue envelope, which in turn decreased the risk of infection. In 1989, Bray et al. reported in 31 open ankle fractures. 16 were treated with immediate internal fixation and 15 with delayed internal fixation. They reported one infection in each group and noted that total length of stay was significantly decreased in the immediate fixation group. If I'm unhappy with a wound, even with adequate debridement, I tend to employ a quad frame. It's much simpler than some of the other external fixators we've seen before, certainly the circular frames and the lizard-offs. So it's a simple external fixator that can be applied in approximately five minutes in experienced hands. I use this for some open fractures, like the one shown, but I was also use it in some closed fractures if the soft tissues remain closed but are significantly injured. This will stabilize the bone and the soft tissue envelope and allow the soft tissues to recover before definitive surgery. It also leaves the soft tissues exposed for inspection where a cast or a back slab will not. An application is very simple. The proximal transosseous pin is passed from lateral to medial, immediately in front of the palpable fibular head. This is to protect the common perineal nerve, which is found posterior to the fibula at this level. And the distal pin is passed through the calcaneus from medial to lateral. The surface landmark is the little corner that you see there at the heel, where this plantar skin converts to the softer skin of the medial hind foot. The entry point is one centimeter proximal to and anterior to this point. And the frame can be applied without x-ray and is extremely quick and simple to use, making it ideal in polytrauma. As can be seen from these intraoperative images, the technique leaves most of the tibia and ankle available for definitive fixation without removing the frame. And the tibial nails can be inserted with the frame in situ. Most ankle fractures can also be repaired with the frame in situ. Historically, fear of gas gangrene with clostridial species led surgeons to abstain from closing open fracture wounds primarily. In 1984, Castillo et al. advocated against primary closure in type three open tibial fractures. It has now been shown though that wounds should be closed early and as was already discussed, preferably within 72 hours of the injury. This may be by primary closure of the wound with sutures or may require the use of a flap. Again, it's always a good idea to have your local plastic surgeon involved at an early stage so you can collectively plan the surgery and ensure that we do not do anything that may compromise the ability to close the wound. In the event when early closure of the wound is not possible, the use of vac assisted wound closure devices is advocated, as again has already been discussed. Godina's landmark paper from 1986 demonstrates that wounds closed with the flap within 72 hours of injury are associated with significantly fewer microsurgical procedures, fewer infections, shorter time to bony union, and shorter hospital stays when compared with delayed flap coverage beyond 72 hours. If there is a delay in obtaining flap coverage, Bhattacharya has demonstrated the benefit of vac therapy in the interim period. This study shows that vacuum assisted therapy is beneficial for up to seven days with an infection rate of 12.5% when the vac is removed and the wound closed with a flap in less than seven days, but an infection rate of 57% if the flap coverage occurs after seven days. That's a massive number. These numbers are important in my hospital where we do not have plastic surgery. So my nearest plastic surgeon is two hours drive away. I need to get this right first time. Now, there is a paucity of literature available regarding the definitive fixation of open fracture of the foot and ankle. This is largely because after the traumatic wound has been treated appropriately, the definitive management of open fractures is essentially the same as for closed fractures. The one caveat that I have is that I try wherever possible to minimize the amount of metal work that I implant. Now, I don't have any evidence to support this rationale. It just seems to make sense. And I treat calcaneal fractures with a closed manipulation, with adjunctive percutaneous manipulation and fixation if I operate on them at all. And I usually select the patients whom I think will benefit from surgery. And the results to date have been very encouraging. Even with just one screw to hold the large fragments in position, 
and one screw to buttress the posterior facet and the sustentaculum. Common complications of open foot or ankle fractures fall into the categories of early and late. The lists shown here are by no means exhaustive, but do summarise the more common problems that we face. Infection is always a concern, and if not treated early, can develop into osteomyelitis, non-union of the fracture, and potentially amputation has been discussed previously. I was unable to find any studies at all that specifically address primary or secondary amputation for open fractures of the foot and ankle. I would like to think that I won't ever see any papers addressing this subject because we now have the skills and the tools to treat these injuries better than we ever could before. And I'd hope that except in very extreme circumstances, amputation after an open foot and ankle fracture has become a thing of the past. Complications of open fractures anywhere in the body are the same as complications of closed fracture, but with a higher risk of infection. Even when the antibiotics are given early and the wound is thoroughly lavaged and debrided, and the wound is closed early, late infection can occur. This gentleman was sent to me from another hospital in January of 2019. He had crushed his foot under some machinery on a farmyard. The initial imaging, which I do apologize, I didn't have it to hand when I was making the presentation, but you have to take my word for it that it demonstrated a complete dislocation of the Lis Frank joint complex with fractures of the shafts of the lateral two metatarsals. The local surgeons washed and debrided his wounds and then temporarily fixed his fractures with K wires and applied a bike dressing. He was then transferred to my care where I rewashed the wound, removed the K wires, and stabilized his Lis Frank plate with a low profile plate. All was going well for approximately five months when he then presented back to the hospital with some erythema around the dorsal wound that was used to insert the plate. I unfortunately was not in the hospital at the time and a colleague brought him to theatre, opened the wound and washed it out. The wound partially healed, but he was left with a small sinus at the distal aspect of the wound. After several months of ongoing antibiotics and dressing changes, he underwent a further wound washout and debridement of the wound and I removed the metalwork. A subsequent MRI scan demonstrated patchy edema around the midfoot and forefoot with osteomyelitis of the second, third and fourth metatarsals. The picture on the left there shows a soft tissue collecting collection that was, could have been drained, but the sinus was shown to be communicating with the second metatarsal osteomyelitis. He was commenced in a number of courses of antibiotics based on culture swabs from the sinus and had a variety of different dressings. Finally, in January of this year, almost two years after the injury, we started him on Dalbavancin. I wasn't aware of this drug until recently, but it's a second generation lipoglycopeptide antibiotic, which is similar to vancomycin. It has excellent soft tissue and bone penetration and is effective against MRSA. It's a long lasting drug that requires to be administered in four divided doses each a week apart, and so can be administered as an infusion in the day ward. It remains active at therapeutic level for approximately 12 weeks after administration. My patient who developed a sinus five months after his injury and had osteomyelitis in three of his metatarsals and ongoing infection for 18 months was given his four doses of Dalbavancin and the sinus closed within four weeks. As yet, he's had no further complications, but we're only just in the early period. So in summary, open fractures of the foot and ankle are treated in a very similar way to open fractures anywhere else in the body. Treatment consists of early administration of antibiotics, thorough lavage and debridement of the wound, early stabilization and early closure. Complications will occur, as with any injury, and late complications may include wound infection and osteomyelitis. We've been very impressed with the results to date of Dalbavancin and think it might be a real game changer in treating chronic osteomyelitis. It's essential, however, that it is used sparingly and appropriately in order to minimize the risk of resistant organisms developing. Thank you again for giving me the opportunity to speak and thank you for listening. Thank you so much, uh, uh, Dr. O'Neill, for being with us tonight. It's an honor for us, sir. Thank you so much. Thanks for having me. Uh, Dr. Ibrahim Kamar is uh, the moderator with uh, Professor O'Neill. Thank, thank you, Professor O'Neill, for this uh, nice uh, presentation. Uh, I just uh, I want to ask you about this case of the Les Frank fracture. Uh, do you think the, this temporary fixation by KY is accepted method 
if you have like if I'm in a remote area and we have no uh, facilities or this this is special plate for this, it's not ideal. Unfortunately, the patient came from a small district general hospital where the three surgeons there had no real experience of complex foot and ankle trauma. So whilst I wouldn't advocate it as a first line treatment, it certainly managed to stabilize this man's foot temporarily in order that he could be transferred to my hospital and be treated appropriately. So no, I wouldn't be writing this up as a case report suggesting it's something that we should do. However, in this instance, it did work and may well have saved this man's foot. Maybe, yeah. So maybe we just we bought back slab and that's it and transfer and transfer patient patient to the higher center for this. Yeah, I think that's reasonable. Um, I can't remember how much of a delay there was in him coming to me. I don't think there was much. So I think, yeah, a back slab would have been acceptable. But I have previously seen his initial imaging, including the CT, and it really was a mess. The bones were all over the place. So I think in this particular case, uh, the CT scan and the extent of the wound, the K-wires were justifiable. I wouldn't complain about that at all. And what about Delba Vanson, our experience about this? <laughs> well, you know my experience because you've been involved in these cases and so far the results have been fantastic. Really, really amazing how quickly the osteomyelitis and the soft tissues settle down. The cost effective. We, we decreed the hospital stay and the, even the it's expensive uh, medication. It's, I think uh, 1,000 for each uh, injection, I think, or 1,200. It's nearer 1,500, so 1,500 for each dose, which brings it up to 6,000 euros here in Ireland for that dose. However, the alternative would be six weeks as an inpatient, and each night as an inpatient costs the hospital 1,500 euros. So although it's very expensive, the overall savings to the hospital are phenomenal. And if it works to treat osteomyelitis, which has been present for 18 months and failed to settle, it's justified. It has to be. Okay, uh, we have... Uh, uh, there, I have a question. Uh, uh, the question is, why not beaming fixation? Sorry, say again? Why not beaming fixation? I don't... Beaming, beaming fixation. I don't understand. Do you mean like an external fixator? Maybe yes. I don't know. So if if sorry if, if uh, the uh, doctor Zahir if he can write some explanation for this question, okay. Okay. Uh, thank you, sir. There is no more questions. Okay. I'll thank you very much for listening to me. One second. There is. Uh, intramedullary screw fixation, sorry, intramedullary screw fixation. About the, you, you can use the intramedullary screw fixation in some, in such cases, in open fracture. Is this for the metatarsals? Yeah, yeah, for the metatarsals. Yeah, I opted not to, again, because I was trying to minimize the amount of metal work that was in there. Now, those two fractures have since healed. They yeah. healed quite early on in actual fact, despite the presence of infection, which surprised me. But they healed, and this man, now that the sinus has settled down, he is delighted because he is back at work. He's doing all of his normal things. I only wish that we'd known about Dalva Vanson two years ago. We could have got him going straight away. This is the um, day guy. This is our witness day guy coming every Wednesday. That's the man, the man from Mayo. <laughs> yeah. Thank you, He's sir. He's not coming anymore, though. I know. <laughs> Thank you, sir, for this. Uh, very Thanks for having me. I appreciate it. Thank you, Thank you so much, Professor O'Neill. Thank you so much, Dr. Ibrahim Hamar, for uh, being with us tonight. Now we'll move to the...